at uh, one point I will be sharing my screen here. Um, anyway, let's uh, go ahead and uh, pray. Sorry for the delay. Um, I have to switch computers here <laughs> and uh, use this, this other. We have two different ones, so depending on the need, um, which is not always clear the night before, I have to switch things around as well as my kids getting ready for school and such uh, delayed uh, my realization of that. So thanks very much for your cooperation. Um, so we continue our little, we continue serving as guinea pigs <laughs> for this uh, for this class. Uh, anyway, I hope I'm coming through clear. Uh, so uh, good morning and uh, thank God for a new day here. Uh, let's uh, go ahead and pray. Uh, Blessed Father, we thank you for uh, the opportunity to learn uh, at every step of the way, uh, whether it's in uh, this format and this way, uh, as opposed to many others, God, that we learn at home, uh, in our uh, family life, uh, with our roommates, uh, out and about. And uh, God, uh, we know that uh, you are uh, our great teacher, uh, the wise one, the living one, who knows, uh, God, how to lead us as we uh, serve and uh, speak. Um, and uh, love and embrace uh, those around us uh, to really proclaim your good news, to, to bring as many as possible into your family. God, uh, please empower us and strengthen us for our ministries. Uh, God, especially grant us wisdom uh, in all that we do. Uh, and uh, in particular, please help your Holy Spirit direct us uh, to begin to learn um, or to learn more deeply. Um, uh, God, some very, very important things uh, so that we can live in joy. Uh, so that we can live also with honesty and integrity as we do ministry. Thank you again for every brother and sister that participates in this. Um, uh, we know that you work uh, in, uh, God in, in, God in so many different ways that uh, we can even begin to track uh, and all the time you're giving to us, and uh, we're very grateful for that. Um, uh, please, please, God, uh, just inscribe in us your character. Write your law within our hearts as you promised in uh, your new covenant. And uh, we thank you for the cross of your, Jesus, um, for uh, God showing us your really endless love. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. So I think uh, as far as I can tell, my uh, audio is on here. So I hope that there's audio is coming through uh, to others. Um, if not, make sure you check your computers. On uh, my indication here is that my my uh, yeah my audio is definitely on. Um, so uh, we're going to uh, begin a new phase here uh, this morning, um, and we're going to get into um, uh, what you can say it's still it's still dwelling in the prophets, but it actually starts to engage issues of the wisdom literature and the back end of the Hebrew scriptures. And um, that's uh, and man, that's an entire other world. We could spend actually three weeks or more uh, studying that in the current format, of course. Right. One of the advantages is that we can take in uh, a, a whole lot <laughs> in a condensed form and ponder that and tease it out for uh, our ministry. And one of the drawbacks, of course, is that we can't get as detailed as we'd like. Uh, and um, that's the way it works. So, uh, as I mentioned before, we're kind of all guinea pigs uh, at a first go around with this format. Uh, there's a number of circumstances, all uh, that kind of you know, that are uh, affecting how uh, we can do this. Uh, in fact, um, in, in my case, please do uh, right, pray. Uh, I'm uh, Williams are traveling out in Papua New Guinea, actually going out there to encourage the church. So, um, so my my fellow staff members are not here. Betsy and I kind of have some added responsibility with the church. Um, so I, in many ways I'm trying to come to grips with this, <laughs> with these scriptures um, and have it teach me what it can, you know, in, in, the, in the time that, that um, we're kind of, we, we're, 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 you know, seeing, uh, seeing over things here in the church um, uh, on both sides, north and south of Richmond. Uh, so I think uh, and hope that God will impart some wisdom for us here. Um, I'm going to share in a moment uh, some slides um, for uh, some of the things that I'm going to cover, and this is very, very, this is very, this is quite a sweeping treatment or coverage of the uh, wisdom literature and how it overlaps with the prophets. So I'm covering quite a bit of ground here, and I'm not going to get, um, I'm not going to get too detailed. Uh, 
at any one point. Um, but uh, as usual, I want to identify a few examples that are detailed, um, but that more than anything are supposed to be provocations. It's supposed to compel you to pray and engage ministry a certain way, okay, and hopefully a new way and more faithful way. Um, uh, and uh, that's what I think God is compelling me to do, uh, to do it all with the tremendous trust, regardless of where right God is leading me. Um, so um, let me um, uh, let me actually let me turn on the light here. Okay, it doesn't look like it made any difference on your end, but it's definitely making a difference on mine. <laughs> um, all right, so let me uh, screen share here for a moment and uh, bring up. Um, one of my slides here. All right, so I think you can see this uh, presentation. Um, if not, let me know. Um, you can see that this is quite a mouthful of a of a title, um, and uh, and I, I didn't want to call it um, a, <laughs> the range of worship and praise in ministry. That just sounded strange. So I wanted to keep it rooted in the the Old Testament scriptures. So I call it Lament, Praise, and Doxological Fortitude. Doxological Fortitude, of course, is a strange, very strange um, little uh, set of terms. Um, but uh, that just simply means right um, strength and resilience in worship, um, which, again, would have been a much longer title, so I kept it to Doxological Fortitude. Um, now, I want to, uh, more than anything, highlight here, first and foremost, Lamentation. Um, uh, right, or even the practice of lament. I should have probably written pra practice of lament. Uh, we know that there's a book attributed to Jeremiah in the Old Testament. It's embedded in this wisdom literature um, that, um, according to the Dempsey book that we're reading, right, uh, poetry and lament from the prophets and the wisdom literature um, is uh, something that um, is one way of dealing with and of dealing with the reality that God had placed them in and that they were in uh, through their own lack of faith. Uh, and that's uh, something that, in a sense, right, we seem to, in a sense, see poetry, and especially prophetic poetry, sometimes is very, very hard to grasp and understand. Um, but by nature, it is something that calls us to get much deeper. Um, and uh, learning to lament well also means at times making the poetic bones in our body grow. Uh, and and uh, believe it makes a very big difference. When I was a younger Christian, I was very sort of prosaic and almost stiff in my way of approaching the scriptures, and I couldn't really, uh, uh, really uh, relate much with the ways that the prophets expressed their pain and their rage uh, and their concerns. But uh, as, of course, as God takes us through life and through ministry, we start to realize, man, some of the things they said and the images that they used, especially some of the concrete images that they used, um, were very, very poignant and very, very powerful. <laughs> um, it, it was kind of very hard to deny that. Um, so it, I, I invite you first and foremost to, to consider the lament practices of the prophets. Um, uh, we know that in the Hebrew division of the scriptures, Right, um, the three prophets that I have on this slide right here, Isaiah, Jeremiah, and Ezekiel, right, all appear in a sense in the latter prophets, uh, together with the twelve, right, with those other smaller writings that we call the minor prophets, and that are in the New Testament, cut, right, um, or Protestant arrangement of the Bible, uh, appear towards the end of right, ending in Malachi, uh, appear towards the end of our Bibles in the Protestant, right arrangement. Uh, but in the old, uh, right, in the uh, older, I should say, Hebrew arrangement, they appear, right, um, kind of many things, probably about halfway, even closer towards the front um, than anything else. Um, so we are talking about here, you know, first and foremost, why did the Israelites enter a major period of lament? Well, it's because they went into exile. <laughs> um, and uh, we already kind of covered uh, quite a bit of the material that um, right through, in particular through your own reading and consideration that takes us through all those kingships of the north and the south uh, leading to the eventual fall uh, right of the north in 722 AD to the Assyrians, uh, something that some of us of course have read about uh, many times over before we ever engaged in this class. Um, 
But uh, most than anything, I, I want to provide just a general overview of a few insights about Isaiah, Jeremiah, and Ezekiel. Um, right, Isaiah, which uh, I will actually mention some stuff about Isaiah a little later on, but just in passing. Um, uh, in, in general, actually, this class is going to last um, probably about as long as the last one. Um, uh, unfortunately, circumstances don't allow me to go any, any longer than about an hour and a half or so, hour and 40 minutes. Um, but I will mention, just as a, as a kind of preview, I'll mention a few more things about Isaiah later. Uh, but Jeremiah, of course, as he's sometimes known as the crying prophet, um, Isaiah right opens up with a they set of Isaiah, a, a set of comments, uh, and a set of concerns uh, that um, are deeply poetic, uh, but that um, are ones that uh, more than anything focus on God's pain, <laughs> right? Especially uh, Israel's lack of Torah obedience um, and their uh, really, in many ways, they're empty offerings of uh, burnt offerings and other uh, temple offerings when inside they are filled with cold, cold, um, right, alienation and disobedience. And it really very much comes out in lack of love for one another and uh, hard heartedness in their relationships in general. Um, and then it leads to that amazing vision that we all, that we read about quite often where he's commissioned in the year of King Uzziah's death in Isaiah 6, right? And he sees that amazing vision in the temple. Um, and uh, all the while, Isaiah has this running set of themes about God bringing a new David, a new temple, a new creation, right? It's in Isaiah that we find the image of the lion and the lamb laying together, um, right? And uh, so it's both, um, let me make sure that, that, uh, all right, let me share my slides here. Thank you. Um, I'm going to try to move here. Here we go. All right. <clears throat> so now I think you can see my slides. Um, so here we are viewing here Isaiah, Jeremiah, and Ezekiel, um, like these collections of oracles of these prophets. And Isaiah, very much in the tradition of, man, God will bring a new temple, a new king um, to Israel. He will start something new. All the while, and this is what's common to all the prophets, they're talking about, man, we're doomed. <laughs> we, we need to open up our eyes and stop flattering ourselves about what is going on um, and, uh, and begin to uh, make it clear that God is going to do something and we may not like it at all. Um, right, uh, the, the famous passages from Isaiah 43, uh, that God is going to do a new thing that he has never done before, um, right? We like to quote those in devotional books, but the context is actually not entirely, somewhat, but not entirely positive. Um, and um, right, Jeremiah is in, of course, the Torah tradition. He's very much ensconced in that. People must listen to what God had already revealed in the first five books and in the Mosaic Covenant uh, and called the people to obey. Uh, Ezekiel is a very, very beautiful book, um, and uh, I'll just mention a few things here, primarily more than anything to uh, consider the practice of lament. Um, but Ezekiel has actually remarkable, um, has remarkable, um, let me, oops, sorry, uh, remarkable parallels with the Gospel of John. And I'll actually leave that up to you to tease out um, I'll mention a few here in passing. The rejection motif. Um, the, um, in particular, if you were to compare John the Baptist's ministry uh, as it's depicted in, uh, you know, in very early and in, uh, in, uh, in a very elusive and almost indirect way in John one uh, and even uh, John two and beyond, um, it very much parallels Ezekiel's treatment of being a prophet that has to be resilient, that has to be used to being rejected. Um, even as painful as it is. Um, and then there's other uh, elements, of course, of Ezekiel uh, that, uh, that overlap with that of John. Um, but uh, th there almost seems to have been somewhat kindred spirits there. Um, and Ezekiel, I think, guiding the, the, um, the writings of the Gospel of John. Um, so it, but anyway, in, in all these cases, there's a lot of very, very powerful images. Ezekiel is probably the most pronounced of all of the prophets when it came to actually being a sign. So there's another overlap with John. 
you'll see the word um, for sign in Ezekiel very often. And we know the Gospel of John is famous, right, for its signs, for the signs, right? So several uh, miraculous signs that Jesus carries out to show that God is with him and that God has commissioned him, and more deeply, that he is the Son of God who has come to act decisively. Well, in the same way, Ezekiel seems to present very often, even up until, I mean, they're appearing in Ezekiel 12, in Ezekiel 13, uh, in Ezekiel 12, 11 in particular. I am a sign for you, just as I have done, so it will be done to them. They will go into exile, into captivity. Um, right? The semeia, or signs, in the, in the deeds of Jesus in the Gospel of John, um, got very much parallel that way of being prophetic. Um, and there are other dramatic signs in Ezekiel 12. Um, and even the following chapter in Ezekiel 14, when Ezekiel starts to upbraid the leadership of Israel. Um, and uh, we talked last time about the need for a prophetic voice uh, in, in all our ministry, both from ourselves and from others, will awaken us if we are not leading or being shepherds as God wants us to. In fact, it's in the book of Ezekiel that we have the famous, in chapter 34, the famous diatribe against the, right, the, I guess the non-shepherds of Israel uh, who don't really sh shepherd the people of Israel. That's where Jesus gets, uh, along with Jeremiah 23, the image of sheep without a shepherd, as we see it there in the Gospel of Mark in chapter 6, um, in the feeding of the 5,000. It says, Jesus sees the crowds and says, oh my goodness, he's filled with compassion and realizes these are sheep without a shepherd. Disciples, give them something to eat. He is drawing on this tradition of, oh, deeply, deeply feeling the pain and hurt of these people who are traveling miles and miles trying to find Jesus and, of course, are missing meals, are separated from their families, and so forth. Um, he's not just seeing their need, but also honoring their efforts to seek God. Um, but uh, so, uh, anyway, it's a, I think it's, very, it's a very, very, very powerful and profound set of, of insights when we just consider the prophets in general. I haven't gotten very specific, uh, but um, Ezekiel took very seriously the importance to be shepherds, actual shepherds of God's people, knowing the sheep and, and uh, walking among them and with them. Um, the, uh, one of the more, of course, unfortunate and lamentable, if I could use that pun, um, elements of this is, and I put it here kind of in right uh, transliterated Hebrew, where did the Ruach, the spirit of Adonai, go? Little by little, as we start reading through the, um, the books of Kings, um, we start noticing that the, uh, whereas in the book of Judges, right, where we find all those verbs about the spirit of God coming on these leaders, Right, coming upon, rushing upon, in the cases of right of, of some other leaders, um, right, uh, rushing upon them in the book of Judges, um, like Samson and, and Gideon and so forth, to lead them to act on God's behalf, um, it starts sort of dwindling away. Um, specific, even you know, specific instances of the Holy Spirit uh, after David and Saul. Um, start to dwindle, even though Solomon is endowed with great wisdom, um, and we'll talk here about wisdom in a moment, um, we do see that the kings, um, right, uh, especially in the case of Asa and Jehoshaphat and Hezekiah, right, uh, especially all in, in Second Chronicles, um, in the, it, it, you, you, know, you get some idea that God is with them, right? God is giving them, in some cases, military success, um, but you don't really see, interestingly enough, the spirit at work in them. Um, in fact, the, uh, in, in Chronicles, and that's the example that I have here, I'm pointing at it, in 2 Chronicles 15, 2 Chronicles 20, and 2 Chronicles 24, and you can most certainly take note of this, let me uh, highlight it, as I did in the other classes, let me highlight this one here. Um, Right. When you consider these, these passages, these are the prophets. I've written them out, Azariah, Jahaziel, and Zechariah. In 2 Chronicles 15, um, it says that Azariah, the Spirit came upon Azariah to counsel Asa. Uh, in, in the case of Jahaziel, 
the Spirit came upon him to counsel Jehoshaphat. And in the case of Zechariah, in 2 Chronicles 24, 20 through 21, it says the Spirit clothed Zechariah to rebuke Israel and Joash. Um, anyway, this is just more than anything to convey a certain point. Towards um, right, uh, the, the spirit enablement of the leadership of the kings after Saul and David becomes increasingly bleak, uh, so much so that it seems more than anything like the, pro the, the spirit of God is starting to work through those that need to provoke the kings to faithfulness, and those are the prophets. You really see a very interesting movement where the spirit doesn't uh, right, specifically um, right, entrust itself to the kings and instead is trying to work through these prophets to awaken these other leaders to faithfulness. Uh, so that, that is, a, I think, a, you know, that, that popped out at me um, um, when, uh, right, when that kind of came to my attention. And uh, it more than anything asks us, man, one of the things, of course, that was missing among these kings and these leaders that the prophets, including the Right, these latter prophets, the biggies, Isaiah, Jeremiah, and Ezekiel, but also the latter prophets that you read about, um, right, uh, Hosea, um, okay, and uh, Joel, um, right, and uh, Amos, and so forth. All of these others have always called people to lament. That's maybe why it's so depressing to read them, because my goodness, you feel like you're getting smacked around when you start reading them. But one of the things they realize is that if we don't make a statement about reality that leads people to some actual grief, we will never hear the word of God. Um, and um, sorry, let me uh, keep it there. And so this is my question to you just at the level of ministry. Um, does lament um, figure prominently in any of your spiritual practices? Uh, this is a tough one. Um, because, right, we, uh, I in particular will speak here, it's hard for me to balance lament with joy. I sometimes seem to think that they're at, at odds with one another. Uh, how can I be in lament, how can I lament something or truly grieve something the ways that the prophets did, um, but then also be joyful? I'll tell you, I haven't figured that one out yet. <laughs> um, and I think it's actually something that only comes it's deeply one, you could say. It's something that is wrought through um, trials. It's wrought through resilience. It's wrought through uh, right um, life and ministry, and certainly not avoidance. Um, uh, I, I can't remember who it was that said that a great practice uh, for learning lamentation is to re read the book of Lamentations while you're watching the evening news, or while you're reading the newspaper, which in this case most of the times is an online edition of a newspaper. Um, but uh, the whole point here is, what is there a way in which we can avoid lament um, when it's actually something to which God beckons us? Uh, one of the things that's clear even from the book of Isaiah is, uh, and you can see then the, the, the connection between lament and wisdom, <laughs> um, is, um, right, is, is if we don't truly enter this, a situation uh, and lament it or grieve, and I'm not just talking about the death of somebody, but also the significant loss that sin may bring into the lives of people that we're reaching out to, and uh, sadly, the the right the destruction that it can wreak uh, in um, in in the lives of disciples. Um, if we don't truly learn how to grieve that and uh, and enter it, we won't know how truly amazing God's deliverance is. And that's what I think Isaiah in particular, but all these prophets convey quite clearly. That's why it seems to have a, a part in the, the expression, but they almost seem to have a sort of bipolar, right, um, right, uh, um, uh, right, a bipolar mode, right? They, they offer words of sure destruction if Israel does not repent, or if certainly after they've not repented after repeated warnings, um, but then these words of promise. So you think, my goodness, so I, 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 when I read Hosea, when I read Isaiah, right, we have these words of destruction and doom that are then quickly followed uh, with words of promise, right? In fact, I think I noted Isaiah 43 in passing before. Isaiah 43 is most definitely a, uh, right, a very good example of that, um, right? When you Right, you see some very, very moving words um, in Isaiah 43, 
uh, about God's presence and closeness uh, with them. Uh, but then uh, there are also words, right, where, you know, where, um, where uh, it's not at all. Like in, in ver from verses 22 to 28 in Isaiah, my goodness, that's quite a rebuke. Uh, but the, the verses before it, <laughs> leading up to it, are uh, ones where, my goodness, God is exalted in his compassion uh, and his joy. This isn't like some kind of confusion or stitching together of texts with no good reason. This is part of prophetic lament. Um, and uh, so we have to find the deep ways in which truly lamenting um, the destructiveness of sin or of disobedience um, is also then the source and the ground and it, or it's practiced within God's joy to always want to deliver. Um, just as God exercises integrity in, his, in, in the pain and even the suffering that comes with judgment and cleansing, he exercises that much, that same integrity in restoring us. Uh, that's what I have found. Um, that uh, it's not, you know, in some cases, some of us may be more prone to really go after sin and want to stamp it out, but then not practice the same kind of commit, right, commitment um, or right, resilience in showing that uh, God will restore somebody after that, right? That God will completely bring them around, that we are utterly present to their restoration as we were to pointing out the sin. So, I hope that makes the point clear. Um, that's what I want to prompt us to do. Uh, let's take here just two minutes to write some notes to ourselves about the practice of lament. Um, I want to link it here in a moment with some issues of, of uh, some practices of wisdom and some questions regarding the wisdom literature. Um, but let's go ahead and just take two minutes uh, to write, okay, in what ways can I learn or in what ways is God already teaching me about the importance of lamentation? Um, I will say uh, as well that in right, Jeremiah has always been attributed right, as the author of Lamentation, which of course addresses the destruction of, Jeru of Jerusalem in 587 BC under Babylon. Uh, that is an unflinching book. <laughs> um, and, uh, and anyway, just take this time now to, to write that, and uh, I'll then read a few verses of Lamentations here in a moment um, as a segue into wisdom. Two minutes. One more minute.
15 seconds. All right. All right. So, uh, hopefully, you've answered that. Um, okay. That, that's uh, prompted you to think a bit more deeply here about lament. Um, and uh, again, I, I don't consider this a pro you know just a practice um, or in a part of our ministry that is that is uh, in isolation from all the others. It's something that has to be very deeply and intricately intricately intertwined with our other. Uh, practices, of especially praise and worship. A lot of this actually uh, has to do, and even the, one of the common threads across all of these sessions in this Old Testament class, uh, and that I've learned from doing it, is how important worship is. And that's in particular, I mean, that's what I mean by doxological, right? Um, it's really, really so important uh, to ponder, um, right, what God, um, right, how we learn about God through worship, right? Through prayer, not just study. But uh, let's uh, speak a bit. Let, let's see. Um, just think about the sort of wisdom and insight that comes to us just from reading some passages of Lamentations. Um, you know, we we take a look here. Let me actually make sure I'm not. I just want to make sure I'm not missing anything. Um, okay. Hopefully, I'm good here. All right. Um, I'm going to read a few passages from Lamentation, um, starting in chapter one, uh, and uh, I'm just—I'm actually going to jump around and simply highlight uh, some aspects of this. Uh, okay, um, starting right at the beginning. Alas, the city once full of people now sits all alone. She who was once prominent among the nations has become a widow. The princess who once ruled over the provinces has become a forced laborer. That's pretty straightforward. My goodness, how hard it is when somebody is at a particular place in life, in this case, a high point, a very much of a high point, pretty much at the pinnacle, um, and falls. Uh, what does that entail? What sense uh, or feelings of shame um, and loss um, and uh, even, you know, in, in particular, some of embarrassment? Uh, but what is it, right, when, and it says here, when you had... The, you know, when you had a particular place that was secure and it was gone. Uh, verse 2, she weeps bitterly at night. Tears stream down her cheeks. There is no one to comfort her among all her former lovers. All her friends have dealt treacherously with her. They have become her enemies. So this is now an abandoned and even betrayed person. All the folks that had been around aren't there anymore. Um, in verses 6 and 7, if you just move uh, ahead... It becomes pretty clear that these foes have completely destroyed, um, and now it's only a bygone era that they can think of when they consider the celebrations that used to con that used to go on in the streets of Jerusalem. Um, now there's just further lament, there's further sadness because the respect and splendor and recognition that was granted to this city are not there anymore. Um, right there in verse six, everything in which she had gloried has been taken away from Zion. Her leaders were like deer who could not find any hiding place. They were too exhausted to flee from the hunter. And that's a pretty, uh, but vivid, um, a pretty vivid image of, of leaders running away. Um, and those who had important positions, so to speak, are not around. So there's a lot of loss here of social familiarity, um, of esteem that very much disorients these folks. They're just cons completely disoriented and uh, don't know where the help will come from. And that's a very hard thing to, to deal with when you don't know where help will come from. And in particular, where it seems like, and especially here now I'm speaking about our cities in general, and even our nation, when it comes to the political situation, quite a bit of disorientation and distrust and anxiety. Um, and it's up to us to really come to grips with that if we're then also going to speak a word of true amazement, of true hope, that is not just lip service. Okay, um, so in verse 9, he actually asks, look, look, Lord, at my affliction. Um, right, it's, look, it says in, right towards the end there, look, O oh Lord, on my affliction, because my enemy boasts. That's really, really hard to deal with as well. 
Um, all the things of the sanctuary have been lost. Um, and then in verse 11, all her former inhabitants groan as they search for a morsel of bread. They are forced to sell their prized possessions just to purchase enough food to keep themselves alive. Um, in verse, uh, right, look, O Lord, consider that I have become worthless. Uh, o you who pass by on the road, is it nothing to you? Consider and see, is there any pain like my pain? The Lord brought it on me. He inflicted it on me when he burned with anger. This is the point where it starts turning to God um, and trying to come to grips with, has God brought this upon me? Why did God bring this upon me? Um, there's also a lashing out towards apathy and ignorance. Is this nothing to you? In verse 12. Um, and, in, right, and more than anything, you can see then the open confession in verse 14. My sins are bound around my le neck like a yoke. My sins are on display. Right? Um, I'm here powerless. I've lost everything. My enemies have overtaken me in a number of ways. Right? These kinds of feelings, we can share them individually. People in our ministries can share them. And then we can definitely see them almost on, a, on a, the scale of a city or a country. Um, and in verse 16, it says, this is why I weep. Okay? We have to understand that in all of our, right, um, in all our kind of gesticulating and, 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 and positive prognoses, you know, in, in U.S. culture, right, we, you could even see this, of course, embodied in the health and wealth movement, uh, especially, you know, in, in some churches, right? It's like we're allergic you know, to um, to truly speaking a word of grief in public, that is, and saying, man, we are deeply hurting without then turning around and, and throwing out some kind of positive jibe. And that, of course, is right and good in, in many instances, but we know when it comes off as insincere. And we know, more importantly, when we are speaking from an insincere place. So um, this is challenging. Right? Uh, that's why we avoid the Book of Lamentations. You know, but, I mean, by goodness, there's an entire movement, right, that seeks to never admit. Uh, I remember, right, some friends that I've had in the church over years, right, that have come from backgrounds of the health and wealth movement um, and the prosperity movement, who just simply never wanted to admit to anything bad happening. Uh, and it's uh, and it's very very difficult uh, to get to a point of true hope when you don't actually go to a place of true pain. Um, so uh, why did the, right, the, the, these Hebrew scriptures contain such passages? Well, it's, um, right, it's because they really wanted to deal with reality. Right? And I think that that leads then as a good segue into wisdom. Right? I think that's the pathway to wisdom is truly engaging and understanding what lament is about what speaking to reality and from reality is about. Uh, when we look at Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, and Job, I think what we see here is a very interesting relationship between these three books. Um, when we, we know, most of us are familiar with the book of Proverbs, right? Uh, we read through the book of Proverbs to gain some very kind of basic but, but very important insight. Um, and uh, I, I forgot to write Song of Songs in there. I should have probably included it. The Song of Songs is almost the it's almost counterpoised and to, you know at every point with Lamentations. You know, <laughs> um, not entirely, but it, it's kind of remarkable, right? What a what a song of just you know of almost indulgence and joy and, and uh, right an anticipation. The book of Song of Songs is, uh, and then read read. My goodness, if you were to read that and Lamentations side by side, um, you know it, it could make you a little you know, a little, give you some vertigo, a um, little loopy, uh, but, uh, right, it, it's, uh, it, it should find its way in here um, in, our, in our thoughts and discussions. Uh, but more than anything, think of Song of Songs, its poetry, the poetry in Ecclesiastes, especially in Job, which is almost entirely written, almost like a, uh, almost borderline equivalent of a, of a spoken word. Um, poem, and that's how we ought to actually think of some of these oracles of the prophets and of the wisdom literature. Imagine some—it's almost like a combination of spoken word and public theater. Right? I don't know if any of us have ever watched, you know, public theater, street corner theater, street corner drama, or theatrics. Um, it's very powerful, uh, and often, and when I've seen some street corner theater, it's always dealing with something that the people in the community 
don't necessarily want to deal with or talk about, but some group of people, <laughs> right, who concerned folks in, in their community want to not just talk about, and they realize we don't have a venue, but we do have public, so let's go out here and, and present our case for stuff that people don't want to consider. Um, and uh, anyway, Proverbs, of course, is a collection of ancient sayings, uh, masquils, right, or, or uh, right, uh, pithy sayings that are passed on from one elder to another, from one family to another. Um, and Proverbs has very much of a, right, of a pretty straightforward, uh, in the other videos that I'll be making that will give overviews of these books, I'll talk about, of course, the parallelism, uh, the antithetical parallelism, and so forth that, um, that characterizes the structure of the Proverbs. But Proverbs does give us a sense that, look, there are certain things that we should and should not do. Um, or if we do them, here are the consequences. Um, or if this is done, it is praiseworthy, and if this is done, it is not. Um, right? And of course, I'm staying quite general with this. Uh, the Proverbs do find themselves at points uh, stating almost the opposite. Right? Um, right? Bit of, and that's what wisdom is. Um, okay? Uh, but that's, uh, that's important to understand that Proverbs gives us, and that's why it is such a good book to study in teen ministries, it, it very vividly and and uh, in clear terms sets, look, these are the consequences of certain kinds of actions. You know, it, some people have called it, it, it will teach us in, about universal moral law, <laughs> right? Uh, meaning there are certain things that follow from others. Ecclesiastes is kind of almost a puncturing of any sort of seal tight, right, um, right, embrace of cause and effect moral thinking, right? Um, the righteous are granted prominence, it'll say in, in numerous places in Proverbs, while the wicked will fall by the wayside. My goodness, Psalms, right? Psalms 1, um, and I should, let me actually add that on here. Um, right, Psalms, uh, the first Psalm, uh, right, begins with, um, right, the contrast between the blessed and the wicked, right? Uh, the, those who dwell on the Torah of Adonai, um, right, are like a tree planted by the stream, always bearing fruit in season, and everything they do prospers, but it is not so, as it says, for the wicked. They are like chaff driven by the wind. Um, okay, so it, there are the two paths. The wisdom literature in, in the Hebrew Bible is very much about placing people on a path, right, on a wise path as opposed to a destructive path. And Proverbs and Psalms, I think, often uh, in, in a number of places, definitely Proverbs, uh, right, highlights that. Ecclesiastes, as I said, challenges that in a lot of deep ways because, of course, it starts saying, look, what's up with this life? If I engage in this venture of material acquisition, it seems to fall apart. Everyone needs to work their tails off and everyone will die. <laughs> um, what about self-indulgent pleasure? Uh, that seems to be futile, too. Um, right, we know that from Ecclesiastes too. Man, I th I thought deeply about the effects of indulging myself with wine. I believe he says in two verse three. Um, that's that's a pretty remarkable. Must have been an interesting right set of <laughs> interesting night. Uh, let me just keep on drinking wine and see what it does to me. Um, right, uh, but it's clear from especially the latter chap latter parts of chapter two in Ecclesiastes that wisdom is very worthwhile. Um, complete and utter dedication to just simply working is not, um, but as it starts moving through this, right, uh, it's, it's such a sort of right, puncture, all of these things that are considered to be pretty standard things in life, like hard work, um, right, and acquisition, the, it, the, the writer of Ecclesiastes, it's obvious, often attributed to Solomon, right, as, right, you'd wish that maybe Solomon, right, took all these things to heart before death, um, but he seems to say that, man, life is just so brief. Uh, we work, we indulge, we enjoy, and it all really comes to naught. It all seems to be vapor, right, as he sometimes says. It's just all a bunch of, right, um, it comes and it goes, it's all very ephemeral, and it doesn't last. And, uh, you know, yes, you can think, my goodness, this is a very, uh, this is a rather pessimistic, maybe even fatalistic um, approach. Um, but uh, it, it is. It starts to actually puncture some of the things that we tend to, you know, render absolute in our lives. And it shows, you know what, 
Um, even by, by the time that we get to Ecclesiastes 9, and there's the rather sober admissions of everyone's death, um, and uh, you know, better to be poor but alive than rich but dead, and, and so forth, um, life is brief, and it needs to actually be embraced. It needs to be cherished. Um, but Ecclesiastes very much is presented as a, oh my goodness, you know, a, a, a definitely a very sobering account of what life is about, um, especially when some Proverbs don't offer too much comfort. Um, Job is a very, very wise, but enraged kind of embrace of both Proverbs and of, of wrestling with Proverbs and Ecclesiastes, right? Uh, Job tries to embrace uh, this practice, um, right, uh, uh, that is of, 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 okay, when life disappoints, when the righteous are not granted good things, and it actually seems that when you continue to read, you know, if you were to start reading the book of Job, um, you know, especially when you read this within the first, from chapters uh, 3 to 15, uh, Job comes to realize, man, I did a lot of things that, if anything, should have brought me comfort. You know, should have brought me perhaps maybe even praise, but I haven't gotten any of those things. He'd basically be saying, why is it that what was written in Proverbs isn't happening to me? I mean, is God, did God somehow, you know, render all of that stuff inapplicable now? What, what happened? Um, and, of course, you're considering that Job is not necessarily written, right? It's probably older than the book of Proverbs, right? Or it's, it shares, right? It, it's, it shares its time of transmission and then eventual... Uh, canonization or, or, or recording, um, right, with life, right, with uh, at the same time that all these proverbs were being collected. I think all the while the issue here is what is wise? How, what, in what way can we approach life to really learn wisdom? Meaning, how do, can we apply our insights to everyday life, right? There are situations where some of the, right, what proverbs lays out don't apply, right? Um, and Job very much, in some cases almost violently, engages those points of disappointment or of disparity or disjunction, right? Um, it's hard to embrace, but Job is a living, you could say, a great demonstration of what it is to stick with God no matter what and take everything to him. Um, but uh, anyway, before we continue on that, uh, one of the things here that, uh, that as far as accumulating wisdom and sharing it, uh, um, is relevant is um, one is that we have to one thing that I've learned uh, with uh, from God's wisdom literature is that we have to be able to articulate a path from one point to another when we're trying to help somebody in our ministries who is going from point A to point B C D E F um, we have to be able to actually speak about that process and what I mean by is speak when we don't know anything about it <laughs> and need to get help elsewhere or when we have been through it, um, be able to articulate the inner workings, right? Be able to speak to the heart of what is going on. And that, of course, will only happen if we've learned to lament in compassion. Um, I hope that makes sense, right? Most of us have heard this many times in our Christian lives. We can't lead others to places we ourselves have not gone. Uh, the Psalms and in particular the Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Job, this in general, the reason why it's called the wisdom literature is, and, in, and it's written in poetry is because this is not something you can write out as a manual. This is not like prose that you can write out, like again, like, like the, the, you know, the texts that we find in handbooks for computers, for automobiles. Right? This is stuff that's only won out because we are willing to go uh, to places of, uh, right, the places where God is very much right, um, uh, in the darkness. He's there, but uh, he's in the darkness and uh, wants to, uh, so in situations where people have to grapple with abuse, um, have to grapple with the consequences of early death, um, of, of having lost many things, right, even if uh, maybe a, when someone is a victim of an attack, uh, a violent attack or a sexual attack, um, right, in some cases we have not experienced that. Uh, we have experienced some things close to it or like it. Um, we have to be able to handle and grapple those things in order to then be able to share the comfort we have with others. This is classic Second Corinthians one. Um, 
right? And Job kind of takes us through the process of sifting through all the nonsense, the stuff that is saying is wise, but it's not, um, the pat answers, the religious, right, sloganeering and things like that, and instead speaking from a place of, you know what, I don't know what you're going through, <laughs> I don't know what I'm going through, and also one where, yes, I've been there, and I'm going to walk with you through it, um, right, and, uh, and I'm going to be with you. But we have to be able to articulate that. Um, that's where confidence uh, in God, in ministry, for, right, from ourselves and for others comes from. Also, there's this practice that we started at, at, at camp last year, um, but I think I may have only done it with, um, maybe primarily with one of the leadership academies, is journals for Midrash. And this is like a, a depository, you know, of, um, sorry, I should say repository of wisdom, right? It's a place where we can kind of deposit, collect, insert, you know, this, this kind of wisdom that other people can give to us about a scripture. Um, and uh, so the way that a prophecy works is just like any other ancient Hebrew Midrash writing. We, we grab a, one of our journals, and towards the back, we maybe dedicate seven or eight pages to this. We put a scripture in the center of the journal. In fact, let me find one here, and then once I go back to, um, to uh, the webcam, uh, I can show it to you. Uh, right? We write a scripture right in the middle of the page of the journal, and then we allow and invite people in our ministries to write any wisdom or insight they can grant to us about a question we have about that scripture. So we write the scripture in the middle, and um, right, and then uh, and then we write a little message above the scripture. What what should this passage teach me about this in my life right now? This passage is definitely leading me to some really important insight. I'm learning something very very powerful about it in this way, but I this is as far as I can get. And you can write a question. What else is he? What is what else is there in this passage that that God would want to show me? And then you give it to people. And you give the journal to people, and they write around that passage to the right or left of what you wrote, and then you and they just have to write a little section, right? They just they, they don't write everything, you know, they don't take up all the open space, they just take up a little corner, and then you keep passing it on. And you end up having eight or nine, ten or eleven, depending on the size of your journal, sometimes maybe even up to twenty, I saw some folks had, uh, twenty little bits of commentary about that passage all around. The, 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 that scripture, which is again, is located in the center of the journal. So you end up getting, man, it's, a, it's amazing. It's almost like 20, you know, 10 to 20, um, right? Quiet time slash, you know, bits of discipling that is of great molding and shaping wisdom from different people in your ministry. Um, and all you do is just pass it around and they write in it. Um, it's really very, 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 very cool. And it's just taken right there from, right, the, the uh, practice of, of Israel. So let me actually, uh, let me, let me come back to my webcam here. Look, uh, so if you see here, um, I've started, I started one here, right? So here's the passage. It's from uh, the Ephesians 3.20. Glory to God who is able to do far beyond all that we could ask or imagine by his power at work within us. Glory to him in the church and in the Messiah Jesus for all generations forever and always. Amen. And I wrote at the top right here, this is my, this is my text, uh, why far beyond all that we could ask or imagine? Is not all that we could ask or imagine enough? <laughs> you know, why beyond that? Uh, I suppose not. I've asked and imagined for many things unworthy of God. God is to do beyond what we ask or imagine, right? God goes beyond that. Um, what, what is it, what, what, in what way is his power at work within us? Um, in what ways can God surpass boundaries? I'm wrestling with this. And then uh, there's a sister who then wrote, some really great commentary next to mine addressing my question right here. So the way that it would work, of course, is that people would then start writing all the way around, okay, the, the journal, all the way around, and you have yourself a little, right, it's a little midrash. Um, if you were to look up midrash in, the, uh, in your Google search engine, you would have images of this very same thing in, but with, of course, in a codex or in some kind of scroll, uh, and you'll find a scripture in the center of a page surrounded by the commentary of rabbis uh, going dating back hundreds of years. So here we have you know, the wisdom that somebody can impart to us about a particular scripture 
and even applied to a certain situation that is just straight up terrific. So if you want to unify folks, it's something they can do within their Bible talk groups, their family groups. It's a great practice, um, right, to carry out. I'm actually going to, right, I'm reinitiating and starting it just with a particular circle of guys here. Um, when I see them at midweek, I'm going to start, right, exchanging our journals so we can write in each other's. Um, so it, I think it really is um, one. And I think, uh, right, some folks still have theirs from camp. Um, and it's a, I think it's a great practice. Um, okay. So, yeah, I can see some folks. <laughs> right writing their enthusiasm about it. Um, okay, so let's, um, let, let me go, well, hold on, am I sharing that screen? Make sure that I am sharing it. Okay, let me go back to screen sharing here. Okay, here we go. All right, so this is where we uh, left off here. All right, and um, taking Job a step further, um, of course, I'm not going to get into a, 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 an analysis of Job. We're actually heading here towards our kind of final 40 minutes. Um, here I'm actually going pretty much straight to <laughs> an overview of Job and the end of Job, uh, only because I want to highlight the importance of um, wisdom and the importance of learning wisdom. Uh, again, wisdom, unfortunately, you will not get from a book. You can read about wisdom. <laughs> you can talk about the importance of wisdom like I'm doing right now, nothing that I'm saying right now will make me wise. Um, and unfortunately, won't necessarily make any of you wise. I'm sorry to have to admit that. Um, uh, maybe that's my little statement of lament. Um, <laughs> uh, but it is, maybe it's wise enough to know we can't learn wisdom this way. Um, okay, uh, but uh, it, it's one of the things that I think Job realizes as he goes towards the end, you know, he starts actually, uh, he starts speaking of lament, he starts lamenting the fact that there are plenty of evils out in the world, uh, there are people suffering. He had at one point, when you read portions of Job, you know, 22 through 24, um, and even beyond, but uh, he's, you know, Job says, man, I, I was a servant to the needy, I served these people. Um, my goodness, what, what uh, would God have me do? Uh, I was a, a servant to the poor, and I, I clothed them and, and helped them. Um, and he's protesting from his innocence. Um, but as, as it continues, he actually comes across a set of realizations. And that's what's great about reading the book of Job, is that he starts in, in, right, in dialogue with his sorry comforters, uh, he starts realizing a number of things. Um, now, Elihu who comes in right towards the end, right in chapters, um, his speech kind of hits uh, its pinnacle in, um, in chapter 33, um, right after Job enters some pretty deep place of sadness, uh, Elihu in chapter 33 um, really is not hearing it. And he's very confident, very youthful, very, you know, kind of upright and uh, in defending God. Um, and, uh, but one of the things that becomes clear after this is that Job realizes, okay, the needs of others can't be left in suspension until everything becomes clear with me. You know, Job realizes through this portion of Job that there are a lot of people in my shoes. You know what I mean? There are a lot of other people who are suffering, too. And I can't leave them all in the lurch while I wait on everything becoming clear for me. Right? He continues to wrestle with God and asks for God, and even in some cases comes pretty much demands God, to listen, he says, "I need a kinsman redeemer. I need an arbiter to come to me." And uh, and I have a slide actually about that in a moment. But um, it's uh, it's really actually a very powerful, even evangelistic um, insight, because um, he realizes, okay, um, if I'm going to live in this world, and it's not just going to be about me, <laughs> um, I realize now that I have to be committed to something. Um, and it can't just revolve around me because otherwise I'll eat myself up. You know what I mean? I'll, I'll, I'll in fact, I now see that outside of me, there are all these needs out there that I can't ignore and that I can even address even while I myself am figuring stuff out for myself. Does that, does that make sense? Um, okay. Uh, as I wrote here, number one and number two, I think stated pretty clearly. Okay. So one, I think other source of wisdom from Job is to realize from him that I can cry out to God but my crying out to God should not cancel out my service to others. Okay. Um, there, right there, 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 
suffering is just as real as mine is. Um, how to deal with that? Well, that I can't. That I can't do. That that's learned through the living, if you know what I mean. Um, all right, uh, and, and that's where I think the importance of faith um, and actions that come through in the Book of Job. One of the great insights of the Book of Job, and maybe this will grant us some wisdom. It, and this was the test from the very beginning, right there. It cites, you know, uh, Job one and Job two uh, was the great test was. Are we close of the good things, uh, right, in some ways, because of all of the good things that come to us that Job, that Proverbs, sorry, promises to the righteous, right, or to those who are his children? Well, the real reward is when we're able to live in faith freely from any material reward. God knows how to grant that reward. God knows how to give it. There are plenty of other forces that don't want, right, rewards to be granted, that don't want right there to be that kind of, 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 you could say, free reception of God's goods. Uh, and that's actually what Satan, right, as the adversary, always wants to oppose, right? He always wants to oppose anything, right, that shows freely receiving, freely giving, right? Gratuitous, just over-the-top love and giving. That's what Satan opposes. Satan wants strict equivalence. You know what I'm saying? If you do A, B, and C that's messed up, that's sinful, you will be struck. And that's it. <laughs> if you continue to do it, that's all you'll get. Um, that's what the adversary in many ways promotes. Um, right? Uh, but God has this incredible, right, um, even in, this, in the middle of a situation where things are absolutely bleak and destructive, um, there is more that God will give in that. God is present in so, right? Deeply so. And, um, and so if he's there, even in when we have messed things up or when we have squandered his gifts, um, he's so gratuitously. He's there freely. He's not there waiting for a perfect exchange of goods, it, right? He is there gratuitously. So the test for Job is will he be freely faithful when things are not in place in his life, okay? Uh, when things are not, uh, and not only are they not in place, but he's lost them. Okay, so those are kind of a set of resolutions in Job that I think are quite wise and that are always, I think, they lay very close to the heart of most of our lives and the lives of those we serve. Um, I mean, if you could, you could reduce many situations, and please don't be reductive in this way, but the root of many of our situations at times is we don't know how to deal with loss and we don't know how to deal with life when it's not the way we want it to be. If, if I'm honest with that, I think we could see that often we are wrestling with this. If not at the surface, uh, it's very deeply in there. Um, sorry for a second. Um, my dog wants to join us here. Okay. And um, right, but uh, please ponder that for a moment. We're going to uh, take here uh, about a five-minute break, and then we'll go to our last phase of material, um, okay, but uh, more than anything, this has been about the importance of lament and developing wisdom, and uh, the wisdom literature in the scriptures very much leads us in that direction, okay, and, and as one transition statement that I want to make, um, Song of Songs, of course, I haven't given that much, uh, I haven't given that much, uh, much, much treatment, but this should be probably, this should be a, a, maybe enough to understand. When you consider the one book in the Old Testament that receives more commentary than any other in the early church during the patristic period was the Song of Songs. <laughs> um, that is incredibly telling. All right, of all of the books, right? I mean, probably the first magisterial, you know, uh, uh, commentary of the of the first even 300 years uh, um, was Origins, right? Origins commentary on the Song of Songs. Why in the world is he writing a commentary on a book that, in in other accounts, is kind of considered very, right? Kind of, you know, specific. <laughs> um, you know, you know, it deals apparently with a very narrow topic. It doesn't talk about the kings of Israel. It doesn't talk about the Mosaic Covenant. It doesn't talk about the prophets. It doesn't talk about any of these people. Why are we, right? Why are we? Why are we writing so many commentaries and quoting the Song of Songs? Well, it's because the church, especially in the early years, saw that man, this entire story 
is best described as one of love, of enraptured, maddening love, you know, of one that can most that can best be described with this kind, right, of you know, put of course quite righteously, this kind of erotic desire for communion, for union, for oneness with God. Um, and uh, so it is remarkable that a book like that received as much comment as it did in the early years of the church, uh, really more pages dedicated to it in, in terms of comment and analysis than any other book of the Old Covenant, okay, uh, in the first couple of hundred years. Um, so um, anyway, you can dwell on that <laughs> uh, as you please. Um, and uh, and uh, we're going to take a five-minute break here. We'll come back at about 9, okay, 9, uh, 18, okay, and then finish off. Five minutes.
I mean, I, I...
All right. Hello, everyone. Um, all right. Sorry for the delay there. We're uh, back. Um, and uh, all right. I had to adjust a few of the slides. I'm going to, um, at some point, let me see. Yeah. I'll also be um, highlighting some of the slides. Um, sorry, I keep on bumping. Hold on. There we go. Don't have enough elbow room here. Um, and uh, anyway, let me. Okay. Um, we'll uh, begin here with the um, final phase here of Job. Uh, more than anything, I'm using this as a segue to talk about um, prophecy in exile uh, and hope of restoration. And um, this is, uh, I'm kind of just finishing off here with Job. Um, wait, I want to make sure, is my mic on? Yeah, okay. I think my mic is on for sure. Sorry, okay, here we go. All right. Hope everyone can see that. And um, anyway, the, there's a, a number of insights here about Job, uh, especially as it starts uh, progressing towards the, the uh, decisive 38th chapter of God speaking to Job in the whirlwind. Um, and uh, some of this, of course, is material that we sometimes read in um, suffering or theodicy-related literature. Uh, and, of course, uh, this isn't necessarily an apologetics lesson, but that element of apologetics is actually important in ministry. Um, so the um, uh, so I wanted to mention this because I think it's uh, it's quite important. Uh, now, the, um, the, there, it's very clear... In Job, and this is other elements of right, that are very important for ministry. Uh, Job gives voice to the need for an arbiter. You know, he wants to speak without fear. He wants to speak with someone present that will actually listen to him. And apparently, his friends are not doing it. Um, and we may find ourselves in numerous situations in ministry uh, where another voice or voices need to be brought in, um, especially if it's progressed in the in the in the manner that. The uh, Book of Job has, where you know the friends that are present simply aren't wisening up to what is going on. I have been in those situations as the one who's not really seeing what's happening, and so need to bring someone else in for help. Uh, and of course, with you know with the assent of those involved. Um, but it's uh, Job in this kind of situation of tremendous loss. Um, you know, is um, wants to speak without fear, and there is a, an insight there. Of course, these are not. You know, it's hard. To, hopefully, we'd never be in a situation where the situ, you know, where the, the the plight of Job is reproduced. But some of us have been in things somewhat similar to that. Um, we also right that he, he's he's pleading for a witness to his discussion, right? Especially when he does. In his case, here I'm not necessarily paralleling it with somebody else's, but his innocence tells him that he has to persist in his assumptions that a defender and a witness will emerge. And uh, it is important to understand that God wants to both speak the truth to our hearts and our lives and our situations and while at the same time wanting us to be restored to him. Um, and uh, J J Job in the chapters extending all the way pretty much almost the entire book extending especially all the way from 9 to chapters 32 um, he's always pleading that somebody has got to be able to speak to me you know to answer to me uh, and not just speak around me or speak about God but speak to what God is doing in my life. And that insight right there in ministry is very important. Some of our right most cherished, you could say, principles of sanctified discipling are about that, are about recognizing what is God doing in your life um, and uh, wanting to serve as partners, shepherds, um, as a presence that also will speak the truth to one another in sanctified discipling. Why? Well, it's because you're not the Redeemer, I'm not the Redeemer, I'm not the Arbiter, we have to go to God, right? It's about responding to what God is doing, not, in fact, usually the trap is just simply responding to what people are doing, which, as we know, often, more often than not, even including ourselves, is not exactly what God is after. God is just simply working through our messy approximations, right, at times of what is best to do in a situation. Um, and I learned that again, you know, there's some insightful situations in ministry here in Richmond and also at camp in the past few years where I realized that certain situations would escalate and worsen primarily because folks were responding to each other. They were taking their cues entirely from one another 
from one another's frustration, from one another's insults, from one another's disregard, when the main, I think, probably the, the, the thing that shook up these situations in a positive way was to redirect our attention to what God was doing. Let's respond to God, to what God wants in this situation. And in this situation, God doesn't want somebody to come out triumphant. Um, God wants restoration, reconciliation, and godliness, right, uh, for people to listen to what the Spirit is doing. Um, so hopefully that uh, itself is, uh, is, is, uh, is clear. Um, but uh, I think that, that's, that there is a, a thread of insight like that with Job. Uh, and he realizes, man, even if I don't understand God, uh, that's what I mean by here, defender again. Even if God is is trying to come after me or teach me something, I need God Himself to teach me what He's doing. <laughs> you know, um, and here God Himself is my defender against God is of course kind of a it's very much of a loose paraphrase of what you know Job asserts at times towards the, the end of of um, of uh, the book of Job. Um, Job, of course, thirty eight, God in the whirlwind. Um, again, a major insight when it comes to being wise about suffering. Um, suffering, of course, is not something that can be answered with a formula, with pat answers, with uh, you know even scripture quotations thrown out, you know, insensitively here or there. Um, uh, uh, suffering has to be answered with wisdom. That is, with um, really, uh, it's kind of you can say almost a messy application of the spirit. Um, right. Uh, and, well, application is also too much of a rigid and academic word. But it's really immersing oneself in the situation to see what God is doing. And uh, here, of course, God responds in a great storm to Job because Job has pretty much had it. So has God. And, um, and it, what turns out is a whirlwind tour, if I could use that phrase, of all sorts of creatures and animals uh, that live out in the wild, many of whom do not come in contact with human beings whatsoever. Um, <laughs> but uh, if read well you'll see that while God gives him a tour of all this, these uh, cre creatures that have absolutely, in some right, they seem to not have anything to do with Job's situation. In fact, God never really addresses Job's situation directly in the entire divine speech from uh, chapter 38 to chapter 42 of Job. Um, and, uh, and, of course, it begins with, do you know anything about creation? Were you there when I created right, the waters, the oceans, the mountains? Were you there? So one, you don't. We don't have a creational scope uh, on life. Um, we can most certainly try to embrace it, but we only have a create. We only have any sort of creational insight because of God, <laughs> uh, because He has revealed this to us. Not because from my position that I'm standing in right now in Richmond, Virginia, right, I will be granted every secret knowledge of creation. No, uh, just the grandeur and majesty. And, and scope of creation from my vantage point is amazing enough. And um, so God tries to give him this sense of, look, man, I've made all this, and I've brought you in on this with me, um, but you are not at my level. You know, we are not uh, on the same point, right? There's stuff about this world and even about the love that creatures share with one another, or at least, we'll put it, the tenderness and care uh, that, um, for example, you know, the ostrich, <laughs> Um, uh, or, or you know, although the ostrich is 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 actually conveyed in very unenviable terms, um, but uh, but anyway, you know, if, if anything, the tenderness is not there in the ostrich, but is in that of other creatures. Um, and uh, and God says, look, there's a lot of stuff going on in creation that you know nothing about. You don't witness it. You don't see it. I see it. Um, and uh, and and I have to. I'm always acting to keep things safe and in order so that all of you can live. And so any of these situations, any experience of tenderness and love, I see it among all these creatures. You may be blinded to it right now. You don't see it. Um, so it is, a, it is a, a situation where basically God wants to widen the perspective that Job has. Not in, right? And it's, it's easy to do this, of course, in an insensitive way, but it's a, it is something that needs to be done. Um, right, and that is very helpful when done wisely. Um, but he says, man, there's a lot of great things going on. I want you to join me in on this. I want you to acknowledge this with me. Uh, and I think that's what Job eventually does. He realizes, man, my perspective has been clouded. I've learned a lot of things, but I haven't seen um, 
now the way that God has showed me to see. And that's really the main insight. Let God show uh, us and each other what it is to be seen. But um, right, we can, of course, be very good. Uh, I'll use the term midwives and all of that. Right? We can help people and be present and speak and, and join and urge um, in godliness to see what God, what God is trying to give birth to in someone's life. Okay, so faith has to serve as an honest, really, response to suffering, not some intellectualized response, especially when we're dealing with um, situations of pain, which are quite common in ministry. Um, we're really called to avoid this kind of abstract theologizing or come up with a really good argument for why the suffering happened. Um, that's pretty much straight out of the book of the Three Sorry Comforters um, of, uh, of, of Job. That's what they're, they're trying to give them a nice theory of divine retribution of why this had to happen to him at that time of his life. Um, uh, sometimes God makes that clear um, to us, even through others, but other times he doesn't. And noticing the difference is, of course, a function of wisdom. Um, so we must seek it. Uh, we must seek it as Proverbs 1 calls us to. Very much seek wisdom, because it will help us not be Bildad's, you know, <laughs> the name of, of one of uh, Job's, you know, comforters. Um, or friends who's not really comforting him. Um, so let's um, let's make sure that that we understand the difference, um, because sometimes theoretical argument here really encourages apathy. It makes people think, "Oh man, this is just some sort of intellectual puzzle, and if I figure it out, uh, then I'll have hope." But it's not not so much about that. We have to learn the story of somebody's life and recognize how their suffering can actually right. Uh, we can. We can learn from them and with them um, can actually be a source of comfort for many others, as again it says in Second Corinthians one. Okay, so we have we have to protest. We've got to cry out. We've got to express our grievances to God. If we don't do that in ministry, we will. It will always have an outlet, and it's usually not good. <laughs> what that outlet is, if it's not our roommate, our girlfriend, our spouse, um, or just other some other human being near us. Uh, and, or maybe some other, you know, inanimate or animate object that will be the perceive uh, the, you know, our rage. Um, we've got to lay it out to God, so that we won't lay it out <laughs> to others in a way that uh, is more uh, harmful than positive. If you know what I'm saying. Um, so, and um, you know, and we have to also. The second point here is about being humble, uh, humbly accepting the fact that yes, we must call an end to evil. We have to hang with God here as he does his work. Um, we've got to be his, right, planting seeds, his, you can see his co-laborers in his field. Um, but uh, uh, let's not call for the end of evil in an arrogant way, uh, so much so that we realize, man, I'm getting, you know, I'm sowing seeds of evil in my calls. Uh, I have to first start with myself. I have to deal with that. Um, okay. And, um, and know that in dealing with it myself and in, honest, and in helping others be honest about the roots uh, and the seeds that I may plant that are not righteous, uh, that's how we can start dealing with evil from the inside out, from square one going out. Um, so I think all the wisdom of Psalms and Lamentations, uh, sorry, I just realized I put Anne Jeremiah in there. That was a mistake. Uh, but in Job, um, is, is towards that. Okay, I think in the end, this is kind of the general insight that I want to give us um, when we uh, imagine um, uh, God's divine relationality. It becomes so evident, especially through here, I just have a reference to Genesis, but it becomes so evident through the latter prophets, uh, in particular, you know, the book of the Twelve, the, the smaller prophetic books that are, uh, that are right that are embedded there towards the end of our Protestant uh, Bibles. Um, man, God feels this pain, and, and we are called to enter it. Um, the world was filled with violence, it says in Genesis. Uh, and, um, you know, it's, it's an it's a amazing God's own heart of commitment and faithfulness. The flood is, even though it's an account of decreation, it's also, it's not the end. It's actually an account of why creation, an example here from Genesis 18, God will actively consult um, his, uh, right? He consults us. Uh, this is something I think is important. He consults Abraham in Genesis 18 as to whether he should destroy 
the city right, of Sodom and Gomorrah, uh, he wants to hear from Abraham. And of course, Abraham there learns on God's initiative to be vulnerable, how to intercede for somebody else. That's in many ways the beginning of intercessory prayer. Another very good practice that comes from genuine lament, and I am still trying to practice this, I just do not do it consistently, is I, you know, I, I, I lament for something, I grieve for it, and then it leads me from that concern to inter intercede uh, for somebody. Uh, usually my intercession just comes because I wrote their name on a list. You know, I wrote their name on my prayer list. <laughs> so I, when I come across them on the list, I pray for them. But that may or may not come, first and foremost, from being prompted by God's own vulnerability to ask me, hey, Gabe, what should I, you know, wh 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 what's going to happen here? You know what I mean? Because I know how I feel. <laughs> um, I'm upset. Hey, are you upset? And, and maybe I need to turn around and intercede for, for those people, uh, you know, the way that Abraham did and the way that Moses did. Um, so I think I've learned a lot to relate to God at that level of relationality, right, that level of, of more dynamic, you know, even emotion that God is God is going to, God is feeling some stuff. Um, and uh, it's, it's, I think in general, he's the blessed God. He is a God of joy. <laughs> you know, he lives in perfect, joyous communion, right, in the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and, and is sharing that with us. But at the same time, that means he does feel a lot of things that will impinge and attack that joy. Um, and the question is whether I feel the same thing and it prompts me to intercede. Um, and that's part of, you can see that dynamic relationship that the prophets have when they speak from God, um, uh, from God's own heart to give, right, to indict, to speak uh, a convicting truth, and also offer hope. Um, I mean, look at these passages. I just put this in here, frankly, because I, I found it very moving. God weeps, man, at the outbreak there of war, when the harvest of fruit and grain are ruined. Look what it says in Isaiah 16, I drench you with my tears. I mean, when they were on the brink of going into exile, which of course covers part of Isaiah's ministry, you know, they hadn't quite fallen into um, exile yet, uh, and then it overlapped with it. Same thing with Jeremiah, right? When a people are devastated, my heart moans for Moab like a flute. Oh my goodness. I mean, that's just very moving. God drenching people with tears, singing, you know, moaning. Um, it, oh, you know, I really wish, you know, and I pray that I can capture God's own Heart like this, because if we're going to speak prophetically, if we're going to intercede, if we're going to lament, and therefore actually gain wisdom, we um, have to really embrace this aspect of God. Um, there's a great book by Terence uh, Freitham um, called The Suffering of God, and um, there's a number of uh, passages there that Freitham uh, uh, right, he, he tackles here where God is, is consulting um, let me just highlight these because these are really great. Um, okay, I I'm going to post this so you don't necessarily have to now rush to copy all of them, even though it may not take you long. But in all these passages, of course, here's Genesis 18 with Abraham uh, consulting with his prophets, uh, Exodus 32 with uh, Moses. Uh, Numbers 14 um, is a kind of somewhat parallel passage. You could actually multiply examples from um, uh, Exodus and Numbers as far as God approaching um, Moses with some situation saying, look, uh, what are we going to do here? How are we going to respond to this lack of faith or this lack of, uh, of, of, um, of trust on, on, the, on, the, on, the, on the part of the people? Um, in fact, in, you know, in verse 11 there from Numbers, 11, Numbers 14, it says, Adonai said to Moses, how long will this people despise me and how long will they not believe in me in spite of the signs that I have done among them? I will strike them with pestilence, and I will disinherit them. I will make you into a nation that is greater and mightier than they. So he's actually telling them, Moses, I'm going to go along with you and forget these other people. Moses says to the Lord, when the Egyptians hear it, for you brought his people in your might from among them, then they will tell it to the inhabitants of this land, that they have heard that you, Lord, are among this people, that you, Lord, are seen face to face, that your cloud stands over them, and that you go before them by day in a pillar of cloud and a pillar of fire by night. And he basically tells them, please don't do that. <laughs> if you get rid of these people, it will not, you know, you know others will not see how faithful you are, how, re how faithful you really are. 
And um, it's a very, very powerful, uh, uh, right? Pat, he, he says, he basically recites back to God, you are the only one who comes and speaks to his people as closely and as intimately as you do. And you are with us all of the time. Oh, my goodness. I mean, First Samuel 15, crying to the Lord all night. Um, and then, of course, uh, you can start reading through Amos. I gave you that excerpt from Abraham Heschel's book um, from Amos, which uh, makes the point that I'm making pretty well, um, better, uh, right, than any really I've come across. Uh, but let's relate to God, um, right? Uh, God to Christ. How long will this happen? Okay, Jeremiah 4, 13, Hosea 8. Um, look at the, the perhaps and if, you know, even God in Ezekiel 12, you know, he's wondering, look, perhaps things, you know, if, you know, as, as he was revealing this to Ezekiel, he was saying, look, things can go a lot of different ways here. Um, uh, in Jeremiah 22, there's negative and positive options. Uh, and God presents this as a, as more than anything, the possibility for change, right? This is, this is a dynamic situation, right? God gives us very, very you know, in his patience and forbearance, he gives us a number of opportunities, you know, for things to go a number of different ways, many of them blessed, others not. And, uh, and it, that's part of this kind of divine relationality. When they did not respond to God's many warnings across the kingships of the north and south, they went into exile. There, the, right, the sins of the people um, really uh, right, um, uh, were so much so that they were not turning around. They were not turning back to God and trust. In fact, they were trying to play the games that all the other nations played of, of, of right, diplomatic relations that led to uh, right, massive intermarriage, um, right, uh, trade, and dabbling in, into other, the works of other gods and the promises of other gods, of other nations. That's how they dealt with, protect, you know, that's how they tried to protect themselves in the latter monarchies. And uh, so this, it's almost like God was being shut out. Um, and uh, so how do you live in exile, right? And this is what the pro prophets, especially in the latter prophets, were trying to address. When things aren't, when you are out of your element, when you are out of your home, you know, when things are dry, uh, what happens? Well, in the old covenant, right, you can see by the testimony here of uh, Deuteronomy 4, 20, 29, and chapter 30, um, and how this is connected, of course, with... 1 Kings 8, um, 2 Kings 25, of course, has that one nice um, right hint of promise that a king will remain in Israel, and therefore the seed of David will come to pass. All of it, nonetheless, is premised on uh, when we read about those, those, uh, those returning from exile, uh, in Nehemiah, of course, the priest Ezra, it's to go back to the Torah, to go back to what God had revealed for as a way of life, right? And um, this is how it's explained. And this is in many ways what Jesus initiates, but of course he initiates it in a way that they had not, they had, they were hoping for, but didn't quite know how it would come, you know, uh, you could say in, in totality, right? Uh, they didn't quite know how this would work out. Um, of course, Israel then set up a very oppositional, attitude. They lost the vision of them being a source of hope and blessing for all nations. And here, of course, I'm speaking generally. I imagine there, were, there are plenty of Jews that held on to this hope. We see them, of course, there in the second temple um, in the beginning of Luke, a number of Jews who really did want God to restore them and so that they could be a source of hope and blessings for others. Um, but the whole point here was that they went into exile and God then had to work through another way of restoring these people from an exilic position to bless the nations. But whatever that meant, it had to come through re-embracing God's Torah, God's instruction. It wasn't going to happen by leaving that or abandoning it. Okay, um, So these prophets very much speak to situations where, look, in exile, are you giving up? Are you going off and, okay, this is a new normal for me, things aren't going well, um, well, they haven't for a long time, and that's how the Jews were thinking. I'm, I'm away from home. I've been kicked out. Well, I guess I'll just, you know, go with the flow of life here. Uh, I'll, uh, I'll adjust little by little. And, um, but no, there's always something new that God wants to break in 
through that situation, and that's what these uh, these latter prophets speak to. Um, I put here the name of the prophets Nevi'im Aharonim. Um, right, we know the Tanakh is just right three abbreviations all pressed together. Um, okay, uh, that middle one for Nak, right? It goes Ta Nak. Um, the middle N of the right, the Ta is for Torah. The Na is for Nevi'im. That's for prophets. Um, and within the prophets, right, the Aharonim is the name for all these latter prophets, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and the 12 minor prophets. Um, and even then within this, they'll divide them as well. Um, and of course, the K for Tanakh is Ketuvim, the writings. Uh, but here are these, right, these latter prophets, uh, or the, the, within the latter prophets, they're called the Treyasar. And, uh, and these are the latter prophets, 8th century, 7th century. So all these are basically prophets that are speaking in a situation of exile um, or near exile. But the vast majority of these, of course, all assume that there, right, there has been massive exile, in particular of the northern kingdom. Um, as you can see, I don't have the, you know, uh, Isaiah. Uh, Isaiah, of course, would be all the way up here. Um, and most of these others would be on the upper end here. Um, and of uh, 7th century, and then in the Persian period, Haggai, Zechariah, Malachi, all these who are in the period of restoration um, and are at least envisioning God's restoration of Israel. Um, okay? Um, there's a couple of these, of course, that are a little harder to date. Um, I'm actually putting a somewhat controversial here uh, on the side for Joel, Jonah, and Obadiah. Jonah, of course, uh, can be very well, okay, ensconced up in, uh, right, the 8th century or early 7th century. Um, but anyway, that's not necessarily too important right now. Um, all of these are speaking in a situation of exile. All of them are trying to call God to, uh, sorry, God's people to recognize that they either cannot get comfortable or cannot ignore the Torah's call to take care of one another. There are so many um, right, calls uh, to uh, truly love, especially the dispossessed and the poor, uh, in these books of the latter prophets, uh, because in as these as these folks started to live in exile um, or live without a monarchy um, in play, that is a, an independent monarchy, I should say, um, it's amazing they started sort of taking up the life of the people that were invading them or the life in exile. Uh, and just enjoying splendor, and many of them were completely ignoring the calls in right in in the in the Mosaic Covenant uh, to love their neighbor. <laughs> um, instead, there were many of them were starting to accumulate for themselves whatever benefits could come from fitting in with the occupied nation, right? The occupying forces, or occupying nations' way of life and their gods, and um, and in some cases being syncretistic as well, blending the worship of Yahweh with the worship of these other gods. Okay, and, um, and so these prophets, they sighed and lamented from a distance. Man, this is horrible. We can't do this. And this is especially the case for sure, um, right, with, uh, with Habakkuk um, and Nahum. Um, it's really quite, quite sad um, for them to have all done that. And also in uh, right, Joel, um, it's, uh, it's, it's, all, it's all kind of going downhill. So this is the kind of the basic character of a lot of these uh, writings is that God's judgment will bring Israel into death and exile. If it hadn't already, it depends on which prophet you're reading. Um, and I'll give some more specific direction of this when I send out the videos for you to watch. Sorry, I didn't, I, I could not complete them as pre-recorded videos, but um, before this, uh, but uh, I think it actually now works better that, uh, you know, that I'll have these videos available uh, for you. Um, within the next week, or the next uh, seven days, that'll have a bit more general background uh, survey type material. Um, but speaking generally about all of them, they do speak about God's judgment, but also God's promise that brings Israel to a future. And if you can see here, that it cannot even see for itself. And that is very much of an expression of God's faithfulness. He's seeing stuff that we are not seeing, which of course is the importance of faith. Faith Right is right is uh, as I've actually shared here in, in some lessons in Richmond. Right, faith is depending on something as if it were so. So we exercise faith in all sorts of stuff every day, from you 
know, the electricity in our homes, we have faith in it that it will operate in such a way that it gives us what we need. Light here, light there, you know, energy here, energy there for cooking. Um, we have energy in a particular right set of governmental authorities. Uh, we have certain right faith in people that they will do what they will do, uh, that we expect them to do. So in the very same way, um, right, faith is depending on something as if it were so. If God envisions and sees something new and we do not see it with our visibly before us, um, and then we're in exile, speak of, speaking of exile, um, we need faith to see that, <laughs> right? Uh, we have to see the reality of God. Now, God sees how hard it is now and where sins have led people to now, but he also sees very clearly where it could go. That's that divine perhaps, that divine if, that's always there. Um, and uh, so faith sees that reality. That's what it says in Hebrews 11, right? The substance of things hoped for, the proof of things not seen. It's almost seen into another world that is not seen in right before our very eyes. But we can still see it. God's promise for the future is seen with this kind of prophetic hope. Okay? And... Um, and that's kind of what is uh, right. This is this is kind of what I end with here. Um, is right uh, the the whole canon of the exilic prophets. Right is, and this is a mouthful. So let me uh, highlight this. Um, is there to equip us to resist succumbing to the vagaries and challenges of life and displacement and deportation? Many of us, right, maybe right now, don't necessarily know how to uh, experience displacement and deportation. Some of us have experienced deportation and major displacement, especially some of us maybe that have been immigrants. Um, like myself, I know what it's like to be scattered along with my other family members, all divided from one another across many different places and wondering what will life bring, um, right? But the idea here is that you don't have to necessarily be an immigrant to know that we know when we are, in, you know, we know in many senses at times when we feel like we're in spiritual exile, when we're in a period of wandering um, or of being shut out. Whoops. Um, okay, and um, and the 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 prophetic canon is very good, especially in situations where not just ourselves or others, uh, right, feel like man, God is really, really showing me. Right, something maybe in God's displeasure or maybe in God's concern and sadness. Right, a lot of what's expressed in the latter prophets, especially Hosea, is very much an expression of sadness and grief. Um, and uh, maybe you know, and maybe God is showing me that, but I can't succumb to how uncertain and vague things are at times in life when things are just not arranged, when I'm out of place or in, in exile. Um, God is does have a vision of where things are going. And I have to be able to faithfully embrace God to get some, to get a glimpse of what that is and move toward it. Um, the canon really does testify that God has been in there all the time in the past, present, and future of Israel. And there is a counter world to despair and denial, right? Um, continually denying what's right in front of our faces will not help us to see what God is doing. We actually have to enter that and, uh, and know that God is working a way through. Um, and uh, Isaiah 43, this, right, 16 to 21, a passage that I alluded to before, I forgot that it was actually on this slide, um, right, is, is uh, very telling. And I'm going to end with it. Um, and then we will have the rest of our days here. And I very, very much, I want to say, uh, appreciate the comments, especially that were put in the last set of, um, in response to the U session, uh, unit number one. Uh, there were just such great insights there um, uh, in, in the exchanges that people had there, especially regarding uh, how faithful God is through uh, these times of uh, destruction, and in particular, you know, some of the insights that are there about continually returning to God and, and embracing his faithfulness. Uh, and even wanting to match his faithfulness, wanting to, man, if God, some folks wrote things that really called me to uh, um, uh, to not go by the way of, you know, to ignore God in some ways and just come up with a solution myself and then claim, oh, this is what God was trying to show me all along. Um, but I was the one who did it. <laughs> um, 
anyway, it, it really called, uh, many of the responses there called me to make sure, man, I'm, I'm sticking with God every step of the way. Uh, and uh, they were was, was very beneficial. Um, in uh, Isaiah 43, verse 16, um, it, it says there, uh, this is what the Lord says, the one who made a road through the sea, a pathway through the surging waters. That's an, a remarkable verse by itself. The one who led chariots and horses to destruction, together with a mighty army, they fell down, never to rise again. They were extinguished, put out like a burning wick. Don't remember these earlier events. Don't recall these former events. Look, I'm about to do something new. Now it begins to happen. Do you not recognize it? Yes, I will make a road in the desert and pass in the wilderness. So notice, I mean, this is being, you know, folks who are in exile are hearing this. The wild animals of the desert honor me, the jackals and ostriches, because I put water in the desert and streams in the wilderness to quench the thirst of my chosen people, the people who are, whom I formed for myself, so they might praise me. And then, of course, after that, it's a rebuke. But you did not call for me, O Jacob. You did not long for me, O Israel. So he's saying, man, I've longed for you, and I'm intending to bless you. But you are not longing for me and asking for me, um, right, and honoring me. So this is part of that relationship with God. And uh, that is always a very fruitful outcome of our ministry. If we can actually, it, it's, it's, we sometimes take it for granted that we have a relationship with God. Um, and um, and sometimes we we don't and uh, and the people we serve believe things about God um, take it as certain truths but that is different from relating with God living with Him um, and we always have to be open to that um, I am not that is not my strength that is not my repertoire I have to always be called my wife helps me so much in really bringing me to a place where I'm honest about how I'm relating with God I'm. That is, you know, my actual relationship with him, um, because she's very honest and very engaging with God. And um, so I, I'm reminded of Kierkegaard's old, old statement, uh, the most remarkable thing about how people talk about their relations with God is that God hears everything they're saying. <laughs> um, and uh, I sometimes will often say, if God heard me say what I said to that brother about how I'm doing with him, would God agree? You know? Uh, <laughs> Uh, and uh, that, that I think is, is a, uh, always a, a, a good eye-opener um, and a call to honesty. And uh, honesty is the greatest place, this is what the prophets teach us, honesty is the greatest place to learn joy. Um, not in pat responses, but truly learning joy from lament, truly learning joy from the foundations of exile, then we can truly see how amazing God is. Um, then we can truly see how terrific are his promises. Um, and his intentions to bless. Um, so um, let me come back here to my camera. Um, I really hope that that has helped you. Um, and uh, yeah, went a little longer than I imagined, but I really uh, pray that you have a great, great day. Um, uh, sorry, I didn't see that. Uh, hopefully, you heard all that. Uh, again, the, some of the exa some of these slides that you may not have seen. I'm going to um, I'm going to post as I did before, so you won't miss anything. Any, uh, everything that I mentioned will be will be in the slides. Um, that I think is what I had uh, up there. Sorry. Okay. Um, so thanks very much for all the brothers and sisters that were here today. Uh, you can see some of the comments um, and uh, oops. So yeah, I can see some of the slides weren't coming through, but you will get them. It was just a few. A few more slides. Uh, so um, let's uh, go ahead and pray, uh, and we'll continue with our day here. God, thank you so much uh, for uh, blessing um, us in so many ways we can't even count. We do want to imitate and take upon ourselves the heart of both the prophets in exile, uh, who uh, looked at, in some cases, some of the prophets looked out from a distance. You know, some of them were kind of country bumpkins um, who uh, looked out and saw all the things that were happening in the cities uh, where there was this great tumult where people were being deported and a new way of life was being implemented from other nations and it must have been very hard to see that. Um, we need to, we, we are learning ourselves, God, when we feel like we're in exile, uh, like we are not, uh, we're out of place. Um, but God, what's great to know is regardless of these situations, you have a path for us. You are, uh, even like you told Jeremiah, the, you know, those deported shall go to their cities and be a source of peace. Seek the peace of the cities that you are in 
and you will actually be a source of blessing like you were intended to be, even though you're in exile. Um, God, so we know that whether we're in exile or we're, uh, we're very much in a situation where we feel at home um, uh, or anything in between, whatever that is, thank you for teaching us to uh, truly uh, lament in the ways that we should lament for our cities, um, to remember that our cities are a place that you want, uh, you love all the children there, you want to redeem it, you want to restore it and heal it. Um, please help us to love the people in our city as our own, help us to see things honestly, and also, God, in that way, strengthen our faith, uh, prove and chisel our joy to be real, real joy uh, that knows how to bring all these different elements of the faith into it. Thank you for showing us this path. We, I pray for all my brothers and sisters in ministry here that, uh, God, that we can all remain unified in this path, uh, that we can uh, persevere with each other, uh, bear with one another, and uh, carry out your ministry faithfully, just as you have been faithful to us. In Jesus' name, we pray all these things. Amen. All right, my friends. Have a great day. Preach the good news. I'm sure God will bless you. And um, again, I'll be, um, I had some troubles with grading some of some stuff. I was, there was checks that were showing up on my screen, but I, I wasn't able to put some values in. But those, uh, those things are things that I'll, I'll finish up and figure out here in the next week. So, uh, yeah, amen for the country bumpkins. Um, that's probably the first time I've ever said that in a prayer. Um, I'll leave that up to James, as well as his joke about getting a midrash at camp. <laughs> that's a good one. Uh, I'll have to repeat that. So thank you for letting that one out. I'll, I'll, I'll use it many times over. <laughs> uh, anyway, love you a lot. Have a great day.